project. It'll all work out. I mean, these bugs you get. Oh, you remember that last time I talked about social democratic housing uh, in uh, Amsterdam and Vienna. And it, in, in a sense, it was in line with the way the course has been organized so far. It was about a building type, about a type which was low cost public housing. Now, today, I'd like to kind of finish up that theme in terms of the planning of the 20s and 30s. Then I'd like to go on to a, a kind of talk that we really haven't done much, which is purely stylistic, purely on the visual development of a style, and that is the international style. The international style, which really has dominated the architecture, the modern architecture, the avant-garde architecture. It and its children have dominated it since the 1920s. And it, it's interesting that I, to me, <laughs> that I really think it has to be approached aesthetically, purely aesthetically, because they mostly, uh, all of, not all of them, but most of them, especially Gropius and the Germans I'll be talking about today, insisted on a purely functionless basis for their forms. Uh, they didn't even like the word style at all. And yet I think function had very little to do with it. And indeed, what I think they did have was a kind of aesthetic passion, a real passion that's probably been matched very few times in history and which is fed by all kinds of historical events, especially World War I, all things like that that made everybody say, we've got to start anew, but most of all, it was visual. And, and, and the elements that created that new visual passion are what I'd like to talk about today when I get that far in the talk. First, I'd like to say a few more words here. Now, remember that this housing in Amsterdam on the right and Vienna on the left is one that uses symbolism. It appeals to the people who live in it, through symbolic forms that speak to them as who they are, what they're proud of, how they want to be thought of, what they want their lives to be. And in Holland, it had to do, especially in the work of Henry de Klerk, it had to do with pride in one's job, pride in one's group, as all doing that job. Here it's the railroad workers, and they make a wonderful train to carry them alongside the railroad track, which talks about time. In Vienna, when the working class was faced with a, with a savage class war, eventually, especially after 1929, it had to do with the solidarity of the working class. They, and they call themselves Fortress Vienna, Festung Vienna. And both those things are conveyed to us by means of empathy, primarily, and association. Now, empathy, I've said many times, is the physical association of the viewer with the object viewed. So we can look in the right and we can feel that that's a locomotive, right? Then the associative factor cuts in and says it is a locomotive, it's pulling a building, it's emblematic of this whole power that moves us and holds us together. And on the left, especially, it's, it's uh, empathetic. You can feel these big forms out like this. Everything about them says defiance, solidarity, protection, hold the line, red fortress, all those things. But it's also, it, it exploits uh, uh, association in the word Karl Marx. Karl Marx up there is a very important part of the power of that building. It, it affects the left wing who watches it with exultation, and it affects the right wing who watches it at that time with hate. And in both ways, the building's aesthetic power is added to. Now, then, as you know, all that stops. I mean, even it, it stops. Uh, here we have to say it, it really is political. All this is destroyed pretty much in the 1930s with the rise of totalitarianism, especially the takeover of Austria by the Nazis in 1938, but even before that by the right wing in 1934. And so this whole kind of form, this whole expressionist form, so tied up as it curiously was with the, with the image of the new working class, all that really disappeared from history. It was written right out of history. Well, Gideon doesn't mention it. Not a word about any of this in space, time, and architecture. It's written out of history. Critics won't deal with it. Even the Marxist critics, who were all by that time international style fanatics, don't mention it, except deprecatingly, which is very odd. It's very strange. It shows that they were not really led by their ideology, but some aesthetic passion overwhelmed their Marxism. It's fascinating, really. Tafuri is the clearest example. We made fun of these for 30 years, and after bourgeois critics began to say how wonderful they were, and that came late, that didn't come to the 1970s or so, then he wrote really a very good book about it. But the best book is by Yves Blau called Red Vienna, which is on our reading list. So that when Venturi came along, 
in this building of the early 60s, he really had to revive it. And he revived it visually and with a lot of its formal power without the program. There was no social conflict. There was really no working class involved here. It was, a, it was an old folks home. It was, a, it was a, a, a place for old people to live in dignity and so on. But look how he uses the same things. Empathetically, he makes you feel that push up the middle in that great big uh, pier down below, which is right out of uh, de Klerk's building in Amsterdam. Then the rush of the upper floors opening out past the frame, so you feel the, f the, 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 the sheeting going past the concrete frame. And then most of all, in terms of association, he calls that abstract sculpture on the roof, and it is abstract. I mean, it, it, it is not a television aerial. He calls it a television aerial. Immediately, the critics we were all raised on international style idealism. It has to be the perfect form to say, how can he say such a thing about our old people? What kind of architect? Louis Kahn, when the mayor of New Haven asked him if he should employ uh, uh, Robert Venturi, said, I wouldn't employ an architect who would crown his building with a television area. Louis just couldn't forbear giving him a blow, but nevertheless, that's what he did. And you see, and that annoyed everybody too, so the whole thing takes on an aesthetic intensity that we wouldn't have had without that. There is a real television area which is sloppy like all of them and hidden behind the chimney way back. You don't see it. So the Bauhaus, if they crowned a building with that, would have said, this is by the renowned abstract Hungarian sculptor named so-and-so you've never heard of before. This is art and architecture. This is a good thing. And everybody would have said, yes, that's a fine thing. But when it's supposed to mean something, everybody hates it. But still, it makes the, the valence. All right, now, on the other hand, when these buildings were attacked in 1934, they were already under attack stylistically in Vienna by this group. This is a housing group in Vienna, uh, and this is a, a, it's a building in it, a, one of the buildings in it, by a Dutch architect named Gerrit Rietveld. Now, Rietveld was part of the Rotterdam School, which was really one of the creators of the international style, which I'll talk about as a style uh, later in the, in the lecture. Uh, and they had, in the early days of the international style, or when it was just being formed, uh, an architect named Peter Behrens, I'll talk about later, formed the Deutsche Werkbund. Deutsche Werkbund in 1907. And you might say that's a little like the Congress of the New Urbanism, in the sense it was a kind of, but looser, it was a kind of conjunction of architects who all believed in the new Zachlichkeit, they call it, the new truthfulness, the new functionalism, what came to be the international style. And they had many exhibitions and the important one in Cologne in 1914, I'll talk about later. Here's one in Vienna, a housing exhibition, housing group in Vienna in 1932. And there you see just the opposite of the Amsterdam School, just the opposite. Both of these things flourishing during World War I in tiny little Holland, which shows what happens when you, when you have peace rather than war. A lot of things can grow uh, all at the same time. Now you see what it does. It completely gives up that empathetic expression of togetherness. Not at all, no sense of that, whatever. Take it all away. Also, there's no associational factor. There's no Karl Marx. It doesn't say fortress. It really, if it refl reflects to anything, it reflects to, to factory work. And you have a flat roof, and you have plain white walls, and you have factory sash, and that's typical of the international style by this time. By, uh, 1932. Now, the other thing about it is that, however, when it was built, it did have a, an associational meaning. And it was actually Robert Venturi who pointed this out to me when I was talking to him about the relation of his building to this. That is to say, in Eastern Europe, in 1932, flat roof, factory sash, white walls, meant left wing. It meant workers' housing because the international style had come to identify with that as well. It meant left wing. So when that was built, that may have been a provocation to the right wing too, but this is a good example of a very important art historical principle that different meanings can drain in and out of the same forms. That is today to us, the Karl Marxhoff still says, because we can read it empathetically, it still says uh, solidarity, defiance, all the things we've been talking about. The one on the right, because we've seen so many houses by Charlie Guasmi and everybody else like that, no longer says left wing, no longer says working class, no, doesn't say it at all. So there's a good example of the principle that meanings change in works of art 
over the generations. Meanings change as the people who see them change. That's very important to keep in mind. There is no final idealistic aesthetic which says this is wonderful and means the same thing always. It changes always in relation to the people who see it. Now there are more differences too. For example, remember, these buildings had no private bathrooms in each apartment. They had public baths. So there was that social intention to bring them together as a group. Now these little buildings by Rietveld, each one of them is a little house, three stories tall, and it has a very sort of modern type of plan. You're very used to it in apartments now. And it's got three or four bedrooms, and it's got a little bathroom, as you can see there. So it does have the bath, and its indication is that you are private. Now you turn, you know, it's like Frank Lloyd Wright turning away from the public realm in his houses. He's, this is more interested in the individual family, and it downplays the group. Now that's especially true of the plan. If you look at the plan, if you look along that road at the top, and you see groups of four or five houses with allotments behind them, you say, well, we understand that. Uh, wait a minute, I'll come to that in a minute. You say, well, that's English Garden, Garden City. One thing the plan is not, consciously, right here in 32, when they were under attack by the right wing, it is not a fortification, you can't defend it. You literally cannot defend it. So they completely give up that whole sense of the solidarity, emotional, which you get with the rectangle, and defensible, militarily defensible, which you also get with the rectangle. So they give both those things up. Now, why? Well, on, on the one hand, it looks as if they are invoking the English Garden City rather than this urban kind of, of architecture that, the, that, that, the, that they were doing in Vienna. And, but if you take a garden city plan of a district, say, about like this one in Letchworth, remember, you, you do have the similarity along here, but then when you look at the rest of it, you see that they really are thinking of the overall block. They really are thinking of uh, intelligent movement through it and out of it. They are thinking of all those separate conditions so it makes all make sense. But then you look at all this and you say, well, what's this? Why is all that? What does that have to do with any of that? What does that have to do with a neighborhood or a group or anything? Why is it like that? And I say it's like that, and I'll try to develop it later, if you look for a purely aesthetic reason. And I think if you want to look at one basic source, as we will for a lot of international style forms, we go down to a, a, a Russian painter who started painting forms like these on the left which he calls suprematist in 1915. And that's Kazimir Malevich, right? And he's one of the most important names. Again, his name was never mentioned all through the 50s and 60s and 70s. But Malevich became the greatest influence, I think, that the international style derived itself from. Because he calls this, now see, in terms of empathy, you can imagine a title for this. He calls it football player. And when you say, hear the title, by associate, you can really see somebody coming, they mean kicking, they mean soccer, of course. You can imagine somebody coming out and kicking it, coming out like that, and that's what you get there. You get that same form. The same thing is true of those buildings. Each building is like one of those planes, like this, in this relationship to each other, which is a loose one, and really seems based on no function, based on a fundamentally aesthetic preference. Now, how is that going to work out? Well, it really works out in Germany. So I should talk now about German planning of the 20s, the same time that the Gemeindebauten were being built in Vienna. So, and, and in a way, we back into the international style with the planning first. Now, Germany had the same kind of movement that England did toward the end of the century. That is the, the Garden City. The Garden City, which is based on the vernacular tradition of each place. And indeed, if you look at a, a, a German uh, group of housing just before World War I on the left, and, and English Garden City, uh, uh, Port Sunlight on the right, of uh, just about the same time, by 1912, you see, you can almost, almost tell it was done by the same architect, except that you stuck it, you got the gable cut off in the same way, you got a whole bunch of gables coming down the street, and so on. You see, there's a closeness. And the Germans had a name for this which is very much like the English development, they call it the Heimatstil, the homeland style. And what they wanted to do was to evoke the German village, just exactly the way the English wanted to invoke the English medieval village. And this is part of that same housing group, evoking that tighter German village along the, the narrow street. 
and, and the indication that this is a, a, a connected with the German traditions. Now, there are two names involved with it, both of whom are very important later. One is a man named Heinrich Tessenau. And Tessenau is a really pretty good architect, and he's the teacher of Albert Speer. And later, under the Nazis, he really was not a Nazi. He did very little work, but they liked his work. And they would have, they would have employed him more often. They certainly employed Speer. The other one is named Paul Schulze-Namburg. Schulze-Namburg. And he was also uh, later an, a, a, a conscious Nazi. A, 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 and he wrote nasty articles for the Nazis about race and architecture, and physiognomy and architecture. And he was a, he was a fanatic. But Tessenau was not. It's interesting that Schulze-Namburg had many interviews with Hitler. And they talked about aesthetic issues, they talked a lot. These were precious documents, and his wife hid them because, of course, after the war, his name was Mud, and all the critics hated him, everybody hated him, and so she hid his notebooks. And then she really got very fond of a student of mine, and she agreed to give him the notebooks. And he was going to get these precious notebooks. And he, on his way, he stopped to climb in the Alps, and he fell and was killed. She never gave them to anybody. I think she must have destroyed them. In any event, there was a source that was lost. It went fascinating because there have been very good books lately about Hitler and the arts, and it's a very complicated story. Speer has written a lot about it, but Speer is so self-serving, it's hard to tell what the truth is and what isn't. But anyway, anyway, this is the way it was. Now, when the, the Germans lost the war, and they had now a new, basically socialist regime in the Weimar Republic after 1919, the Weimar Republic wanted a lot of housing, starting off around Berlin. And they wanted to keep the English Garden City mode. And unlike the Viennese, who argued the same point, they did not build in the middle of the city. It was their great loss, because they lost the city to the Nazis later, because they did not have a working class base they might have had. And they wanted to build out in the country, in what they called settlement, Siedlungen, Siedlungen, like the English Garden City. However, they wanted it to have a socialist cast, so they did not want to emphasize the single family house or the traditions of Germany. So they wanted abstract, and this is a, one of the first of them. The housing group in Berlin was called the Gehag, G-E-H-A-G, and the major architect was Bruno Taut, T-A-U-T. Now, you see, he's basically a garden city idea he's got there, but there is no sense of the vernacular continuity. It's abstracted already, and there's no sense of the individual house. And the workers basically, deeply, didn't like it. We know that because later, when the Nazi, one of the, 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 the devices the Nazis used was housing, was architecture. And there's an architect who worked for the Nazis, and he completely disappeared from history until he reappeared, at least from history that I knew it, until he reappeared in... Dwayne E. Platter Zyberg's New Civic Art. And that's one named Carl Henrici, H-E-N-R-I-C-I. And if you look at his Garden City plans, which you'll see in there, they're really pretty good. And he builds them, we think so. That makes us fascists, you know that, in the hands of the, of the living uh, new modern critics. I mean, it's, uh, some of these critics are still calling, calling Poor Little Seaside a fascist organization. In any event, and as one of his groups on the right, and he brings back the single family house, the image of the single family house, and they love it, and they go for it. It's because it speaks to them symbolically, you see. And the, the social, and so typical of how the Nazis won Germany. Here are the socialists, and they're in this baggy, old, old, dusty suits, and they're trying to talk reasonably, what they regard as reasonably. And here are the Nazis, and they have the symbols. They bring up all the symbols, the army, the eagles, the ceremonies, the uniforms, the single family house, German tradition, and they get them. And there is a good, in interesting conversation between Goebbels and Mies van der Rohe about that. And Goebbels says, I like your architecture. Architecture is fine, but the people don't. It's not for the people. We can't use it. Anyway, that's the thing. So anyway, this is what happens. Now, it is a kind of soulless, when you look at the plan, and one of these Gaha groups, it doesn't look like a neighborhood or anything like that. It looks like a machine, a drawing for a machine. And you see it compared to, a, say, Hampstead Garden Summer, which looks like a village. You can see these as being places. And you can imagine this is a very important place. And 
this is other than this is a smaller place, and this is a more important group over here, and it makes sense in the way people live. This is just it's absolutely abstract. And uh, it's, it's odd, it's that side of the German mind which is so powerfully given to abstraction, able to abstract, and powerful enough to abstract, but then sometimes it just gets carried too far. And I see, you see the group, and you can't help but think that these things mean nothing. Basically, in terms of human life, symbolically, whatever way, they really don't mean anything. Now, what, they, what the architects would like to have them mean, when architects like Walter Gropius, who I come back to later, who by this time, by the middle 20s, is, is really the leader of all this in Germany through the Bauhaus and so on, which I'll talk about later. What he really would like them to think about is the machine age, the new world. Everything Gideon writes about later. Space time, well, he, didn't, he didn't think about space time. The machine, he certainly loves it in this housing he does in Dessau when they moved there in 1925 from Weimar. He likes the fact that those big light standards, God knows are exuding what cancerous rays from them. Nevertheless, he, doesn't, he likes them marching down the middle of the street. That's the kind of image he'd like to have. And the buildings are abstracted on both sides. The plan is still out of the village. Like that, but logically, it turns into the long, continuous slab. And that's what happens in Frankfurt. And that again, there's Ernst Mai in Frankfurt, who I talked about before, who controls the Arctic. There's a group. It's a group of about 1926. And you can see it's really the same type that Riedfeld adapts in 1932 for Vienna. Same, each one is a house with the same amenities that we talked about before. But Mai is the one who took really the, the deadly step, which was this. If you're going to abstract it, then abstract it all the way. And all the urbanistic constraints, which you don't want, and I'll talk when I talk about stylistic development and that, why they don't want those stylistic constraints, urbanistic constraints. They want to be free to do what they like, like a painter. That this is the worst, that's a little better, that's a little better, but this is the best. Watch the focus. When I, I touched it, it went out, I don't know. Maybe I push the screen. It's a little better than that. In any event, each one is lined up. Each one is right there on the road like this. And the front of this looks in the back of that, or the back of that looks in the way And the un indefensible slabs. Now, you know, that's what I put out, had an effect on the Lindenhof group by Carl Ain in 1926, with the front of the, the living units look at the back of the other side, and all sense of, in that sense of, of, you know, unity, urbanistic unity is lost. Nevertheless, it still is closed on both ends. It still makes sense. It's enclosing a space that make, makes sense. But you see, these don't. And while that looks harmless enough, if dumb, I mean, it is really, it's one step from that to just the slab where everything's gone. I mean, all neighborhood is gone. All togetherness is gone. Defensibility is lost completely. If you're talking in European terms, you really have to say you're, you're, at the, you're at the absolute mercy of the troops when they march in. There's no way to defend that. And you can't defend it emotionally either. Where are you? So the drug lords take over and the crazy kids take over and they break all the fixtures. We're used to what happens when they're built and they're being torn down all over the world. Here's a mad German, uh, Hilbersheimer, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, 1925. Look at his proposal for the new world. What a nightmare. I mean, this is real a nightmare. How could anyone ever look at this and say it was anything except a nightmare vision? Who wants to live in a world like that? But they had us all convinced that that's the way the world had to be. There are a lot of hot shots with the computer right now, especially out of Holland, I don't know why, who are making crazy worlds. Crazy. And, and mad worlds, too, and worlds where you wouldn't want any part of. But they really, you wait and see, I mean, if those people have their way in New Orleans, they're going to be trying to propose crap like that in New Orleans right now, under that Kroloff and Betsky and so all those people. I mean, they are, are architectural adventurers who are irresponsible and capable of anything. It's really interesting. It's fascinating. Look at that, though. And, and he came and he taught at IIT with great, everybody loved him. He said, I met him. He's a very sweet little man. Uh, he made, <laughs> but my God, look at it. Anyway, that's what comes of this. Because the whole urbanistic constraint is gone, you see, now it's just, just a repetition of these elements. Now, part, I think, that it was in response to that, in a reaction against that, that Gropius and a lot of these other architects 
got together and tried to show that with the international style planning, you could have a humane housing group. You could do it. So we should look at it from that point. And this is the Siemensstadt houses, the Siemensstadt houses in Berlin in about 1927 uh, to 32. And you see they set them in greenery, there's a lot of planting. They're also affected by Le Corbusier's vision, which was a good deal like this at the same time, which I'll talk about later. And they wanted to make each one of these slabs different. Almost the basic type was Gropius' own, which is now fully developed international style, flat roof, white rendered walls, uh, horizontal rings, balconies, so on and so on. And the plan is the plan you've seen before. You look at it and you say, why isn't that here and the kitchen here? And you say, well, they want to keep the kitchens back to back. That's, the, like, that's why Philip Johnson so many years later said, I'd rather sleep in the neighbor's chart cathedral at the nearest John, three blocks down the street, than I would in a Harvard house with back-to-back -back bathrooms. Well, you're a back-to-back because you're a bathroom for the, whatever the case. You know, it's a plan that looks awful, but to, to them it must have looked fairly luxurious. Got a balcony, got a bath, so on. Same, same simple, but they wanted each one to look different. Now the only one that to me really looks different than any of the others mainly because almost nothing is more powerful probably, is Bruno Tauts. Bruno Taut had one. And here he just, he's just a mean looking building with these nasty little windows, those shining things, and he paints it these really strident bands of color. And I, I, I it would have stood out like mad. I don't know what it would have said to you. It might have just been the only one that said anything like revolution, or we are tough folks or anything like that, but that wasn't what they were after. Here's somebody, one by a man named Hans Scharoun. Now Scharoun was passed himself off as an expressionist architect, and, but all he, he did really that's different than Gropius is have these curving walls here that are usually around the stairwells, and, or, and that's all. Things that Gropius would never have done. So what does that do to you emotionally or symbolically? Well, really nothing. Stop thinking about it. Does it mean anything one way or the other? You might like it, all right? Not like it. Doesn't mean anything. The one who's most different is a man named Hugo, um, and Sharon survived Hitler to build some of the most horrible buildings in Berlin that you can imagine. One right along the walls, indescribable. The great uh, orchestra hall that is really nice inside, but really like a decaying tent on the outside, really pretty bad. All of these things near uh, the uh, uh, Potsdamer plots at the present time. But it, it, Hugo Herring had a kind of revival of interest in him in the 1960s when Corbusier was doing his late style, expressing the concrete. But in the 1920s, he stood out against Corbusier and he said it's not to be ge geometric purity and so on that we want. We want an expression of structure. So he had the concrete and he had the tile or the brick and he had it more plastic. And it's nice, it's different, but see, it doesn't do anything emotionally that I can see. And they like to put these together like this. Now when you see a group like that and you think of yourself living there, you ask yourself, what does that do for me emotionally, say? What does that do to me in terms of satisfaction or feeling good about things or whatever the case? You say, well, it's pleasant. I mean, at least it's better than, than it might be. But does it say you're all together in a great a luxury hotel, well defended. Does it say anything? It doesn't. Does it say uh, you are noble people who are working in a great craft? That your work now, even though it's in uh, industry, is uh, is noble. Well, it doesn't do that either. It, it it it's kind of tries to get away by a kind of variety that doesn't focus to any meaning. Now, a good example of how bad that can be, I think you find right there in New Haven, Connecticut. And right away, it could have been a wonderful place. This is the line that that boulevard, that diagonal boulevard that went from Temple Street to the new railroad station, that's the new railroad station by Cass Gilbert. It goes right through that thing which was never built. He said, this thing was built. And you look at that and you say, what's he after? And he, he tries to ornament a little bit. And he plays with the brick, a block like Rudolph. This is Charlie Moore, Charles Moore. And he paints the block a little bit. It's all that color's gone now. They paint it differently. That's Kevin Roach's Knights of Columbus Tower down at the end. And, but what does he do? I mean, does he, 
There are people who don't want to be there, first of all. They're there because of what Frank Lloyd Wright called the iron hand of realty. They can't get to the suburbs. They can't get to a single family house. They can't. Most of them are black and they can't get out there, both economically and because of, 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 of social pressure, codes and things. Uh, and uh, originally, the, uh, Mies had this site and he did a few high rises. And then uh, the mayor began to take cognizance of our attacks on what they were doing. So he did just the wrong thing. He fired me. <laughs> and, uh, and he got Charlie Moore, who's supposed to be just the opposite of me. And Charlie Moore did this village. Now, what is it all about, you see? You look at it and you say, what does that tell me? What is it? Now, you say, right up there is Yale. And Yale has quadrangles. And quadrangles say, together, we're proud to be together, we're in one place, we know that. It also has great entrances, we've talked about before, that say this is an important place, this is different, so on. That's exactly what uh, Karl Marx left in. Remember when you came out of the railroad station, you saw this, this is the other side, but you know, it's the same thing over there, saying we're together, we're proud of this, we're here because we want to be. But when you come out of here, look in there, what, what you see is this all covered with graffiti, too, because nobody wants to be there. They don't want to be there. They don't want that. Now, they don't want that either on the right. And Karl Marx would mean nothing to them. They'd laugh. I mean, what, are, what are you talking about? What they want, they showed us what they want. When I used to show these slides, I didn't know what the answer was to what they wanted, but I, there is an answer, probably not the final answer. We know what they want. They wanted Hope Six. They wanted the house. They wanted this symbol is stronger to them than that symbol, which we should thank God for, I suppose, in the United States instead of, of cutting the funding so Hope Six is dying, or dead, whatever the case. Anyway, so in general, in, and I'll talk about Corbusier later, international style planning is cataclysmic and disastrous, seems to me, in the long run. Because it basically doesn't answer the basic need of human beings for symbol. Now, there are many ways to look at that. I once said exactly that at a meeting of people who were mainly, mainly ecological. They were very bright, though. And one of them said, I said, the poor need symbols, especially. He said, yes, that's why they remain poor. In a way, there's one, one, that's one truth. In that. But nevertheless, it's a fact. I mean, especially if you don't have much, you have to share with everybody else, and you have to live by a vision which transcends reality. <laughs> anyway, the Nazis understood that. That's the horror of totalitarianism. Maybe other people understand it today, too. Now, what is the international style then? Which we talked about the planning. And we go back to uh, Vienna in 1932, to that housing group. Now, this is one of the only few buildings in housing by uh, Adolf Loos, the one who wrote Ornament und Verbrechen in 1905. And he didn't in engage himself in any of those great combined projects. Those were not by the great name architects, the same thing today. And he did these two buildings here, two houses here in that group where Rietfeld had done most of the others. And you see, they're, they're nice. And he, one thing he designed in terms of was a section where he had open up a level and another level that cuts across. Whether that really happens there or not, he suggests it on the outside. But what are the major characteristics of this fully developed international style building of 1932? Well, first of all, it's abstraction. You can see that. It's really very abstract cube. Everything takes away from the abstraction, like a roof, for example. No, none. It's got to be a cube, like this. Which, when you stop to think of it, is odd, because buildings take rain. That's one of the major things. But this thing we got so used to, that flat roof, it had to be. Now, how far can you take that? Well, you take it right back, first of all, I'm sure, to the French revolutionary architects of the late 18th century, especially Claude Nicolas Ledoux. And some books were written, good book, one book called From Ledoux bis Le Corbusier, by a man named Kaufman, From Ledoux to Corbusier. And there is that jump. Corbusier does these things of pure geometric shapes, cube, globe, sphere, pyramid, shapes like this. And that's exactly what you begin to get. Now, you begin to get those first. The fascinating thing is, again, there's so many things are there in Vienna. And if you look at this building, the Secession building of, 
1896, uh, 98, we talked about before by Joseph Murray Albrecht. You can see it's like one of those corbus. It's like a combination of the, of the cube up here and the sphere, like this. And he's taking the classical uh, dome, which, which he, doesn't, he wants to suggest, but he doesn't want to use it, and he makes instead the Frober ball in the box that we talked about before. So he abstracts it like that. And that's 1896-98. Now, here in 196, there's a church called the Stone Church, which is interesting, it's named after a material, a stone church in the major insane asylum, as they call it then, mental hospital in Vienna. And it's by Otto Wagner. And again, you see how much it's like uh, Albrecht, or like one of these, it's the sphere and the cube, but here it is, the dome. But it's a very abstracted and tough Classicism, you can see it if you get close. See that powerful that thing is. The powerful, abstract, and cubical form that you have here. But you get one other thing that you don't have in the classicism of Ledoux, or the abstraction. He wants it to look like metal. They call it the stone church, but he wants it to look like all this is stone, cladding, but the way he details it, he wants to make it look as if it's bolted onto a frame. It look like thick metal plates. Maybe it shows it even better here. He wants it to look like metal. In other words, there's a kind of romance of the machine, of machine materials, of new materials. In National Science, always talking about new materials. Uh, new materials are involved here. And inside, that dome is treated with a, a surface pattern which makes it look like a light lattice, like a lot, light skeleton lattice, maybe metal, maybe a light metal lattice. Everything is to break up the stone plane of the thing. Now that comes to fruition in a beautiful, classic, uh, industrial material, uh, abstracted a building, which is the, the main public library. The, I mean, the main post office, central post office in Vienna of 1905 by Otto Wagner. And you see the detailing there. It's, it's like a beautiful set of columns, so on, but they're in metal. Here. And he picks up the lessons, as it were, if that's what they are, of the, of the uh, uh, Crystal Palace. And they have the same shapes, which are reproduced in one series right here. And that, you see, it's very different from that building of just a few years before, also with the metal structure inside. The Maison du Peuple in Brussels by Victor Orter, where he tries to make it look continuous, like a plant growing as we talked about before, and all of it like seaweed moving down toward the stage, all that. Uh, he wants it just the opposite here. He wants it abstracted. So it's, it's a mixture of classicism, beautifully classic space, classic order, like this, in metal, in the new machine materials. So you get those two, the abstraction, the classicism, and an excitement about industry that you get here. You get the same thing on the facade. The facade is beautifully, classically sighted in Vienna. This photograph, I hope, where we're standing is on an important big boulevard that goes this way. Then in the boulevard, it opens like this, a small square, with that in the middle. And then two buildings, you see them here, very close, very tight. Then there's a tiny little alley that runs there, and on that street, on that alley, is the post office. And it shines like that, because it's in this very light stone. It shines like that out of the darkness back there. It's a dramatic and wonderfully intense, close urban sighting. But again, one reason it does that is that he makes it look like metal. And he details it look as if it's all bolted onto something, the frame. So Wagner is the one who brings together the classical, the abstraction, and the love of the new industrial material in Vienna. But then Vienna really isn't the place where this really, it doesn't really have the hardness and the bigness to do this. You have to go to Germany then to have this developed further. And I use this to, to give an indication of Wilhelmine, Germany, with the new fleet and the new industry, the crazy Kaiser and the power and all of that, everything Germany really becoming very fast and major, almost the major world power like this. I don't know what it's for or anything, but it's a wonderful, industrial, architectural shape of that period just before World War I. And when you think of German industry of that time, you think of Krupp, K-R-U-P-P, -P, that is the big armaments maker. But Krupp 
which was a very sort of totalitarian organization, Krupp was in charge and the workers did what he told them, was another great big trust. And that's the electrical trust, the uh, Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft, the AEG. And the AEG was one run by a man named Walter Rotnow. He's one of the heroes of the 20th century. And he saw himself, a little bit like Larkin in Buffalo, he saw himself as an enlightened employer. And he wanted his workers to be partners with him and share in the profits in the thing. And he started all kinds of workers' programs and health programs and so on. And later, after the revolution, he was a, a, a minister in the uh, Weimar Republic and he was assassinated by the right wing. He was Jewish too, that's another reason they hated him. And he ran this Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft as really the rival of Krupp and he regarded himself as the rival of Krupp for the soul of Germany. It's very moving. Right. And look, but what you got this, you got this heroic scale, this kind of Jules Verne, like that. This Jules Verne scale, a 19th century scale of the heroism of modern industry, big dynamos, big heavy stuff, heavy industry. Like this. And he hired Peter Behrens. It's Peter Behrens who formulated the doctrine of Zachlichkeit, that is truthfulness, that is really functionalism. So he says, look, if you have this, you have to show the structure, like this. And then on the outside, you have to exactly show that. You have to show what's happening, you have to show the structure. You, you encase it in brick just as tight and thin as possible, and you detail it just exactly as possible to show, you see, the shape of the truss up there is the new classicism, it's the new uh, pediment, is what the metal structure is. And there's proudly AEG, Algemeine Elektricitäts, Gesellschaft. And when you look at that right away, you can see who his greatest student was, that is Mies van der Rohe. You can see Mies all through that. You can see IIT is all through that building when you look at it there. He had another student named Walter Gropius, we'll talk about in a minute. And then, and he organized the Deutsche Werkbund, as I said, in 1907, which was this kind of union, informal union of architects who believed in the new Zachlichkeit, the new truthfulness, but really that's those, the new functionalism. And now, then he did the, the major building for the AG. He built a lot of buildings for the AG between 1908 and 1911. And this is the headquarters building where you have not only a big machine shop, but you also have offices and so on over here. Now here again, he really wants it to be more. He, he gets more than this. He, he does express the truss in there, but he makes it look more like a classical pediment, it's like a pediment. And then actually, if you look at that building, you see that it's really very subversive of the basic German tradition of Schinkel. If you go back to the Neue Wacke, Schinkel here, you see, you have the pediment, which you have here. You have the columns, but that's where he subverts it. Because the columns support the pediment. You feel the load on it. But this is glass. The pediment projects. And the glass is slanting back in. So it can't support that. It clearly looks as if it's hung off it. So he reverses the empathetic response to the structure here. That really looks hung off, this great thing. And that's added to by the fact that the big sides, like these solid sides, are now both there, but they're heavily rusticated to be even more powerful, and they lean in, they batter in. They're here at this point up here, you go back into here, you get that shadow, and here are the, the uh, metal supports for the truss up here, and they're vertical, but this is going in. So you get this powerful play of forces which are going on there, and which come down in the end to that dark, powerful, intersection, this wall. Look at the size of them in relation to cars. This little Volkswagen here, right here, is right in front of a detail, which you'll see, it looks, it, it looks bigger than the Volkswagen when you really think of it. As you can see, it's not, but it approaches it in size. It's that big joint, which is a flexible joint. Look at that grind. You really feel the heroic power of industry, and how excited they were. I think Barron's is a very great architect, at this, especially right at this period. And as I say, everybody wants to work with him. Corbusier later claimed that he worked with him. He didn't. He visited him, though. Gropius worked with him, and Mies worked with him. And Gropius was the one that first sort of tried to break loose on his own. And Gropius does this. In 1910, he builds a shoe factory, the Alfeld an der Leine. And it's, uh, look what he does. He takes as 
as Behrens had taken Schinkel and subverted it, he takes Behrens and subverts it. First of all, he gets rid of the classical reference. Classicism is still there in the abstract geometry, but he gets rid of the reference. No, instead of that, he really makes the hero here the thing that is not really, it's a lot of it here, but it's not the hero, but he makes the glass the hero. And all of a sudden he takes this big rusticated thing and he has just one of them, and he has the glass eat it up across the top. And across, against this heavy mass, he has that absolute transparency going right through there, like that. And of course that's not a bit like Frank Lloyd Wright, where the glass is always deeply under an overhang, so what you feel is the continuity of the void. You don't feel the glass. You don't care about the glass. But this, you see, is the glass comes to that point. Now the other thing you have is, as you look through the glass, you see changing, because of the reflections, transparencies of the floor levels, which are in there, behind the stairs, up there. Now, I don't know whether he had this in mind when he did this in 1910, I think probably not, but historians very soon made the connection. It's like the Cubist paintings that are being done at that time, like analytical Cubism. By this one, like this one by Picasso. Where you have, you see, analytical cubism is kind of yeasty. It's as if you had forces coming into the, together, slowly shaping a form in the middle. It's very plastic, which projects, and which comes here with plane after plane after plane after plane, which you have seen, don't see, and change, transparency. See, that's what you get there. Watch when I show a slightly different slide, just slightly different with a light is a little different on the glass. What's that? See, it's different, see? Really, it's a tiny bit. Gropius must have been really excited about that. The glass becomes the hero. Both its, its transparency and its reflectivity, and then the magic of things behind glass. The glass just eats the building over. It's really kind of wonderful. The first architect we've seen do that, really, that I can think of in quite that same way. All right, and then the other things that we have here. First of all, besides that, it's also something that's going to be very characteristic of the international style, which always claimed it was very close to industry, is that now it's not like the Algemeine Elektricitätsgesellschaft. It's only a little shoe factory, and it's a small operation, and it's clean. You see, and it's, and it's, ni it's this nice little space. It's a sanitized world. It's no longer the heroic Jules Verne 19th century. It's a more 20th century sanitized industrial form, which the international style always goes for. You can see that there. And you can see it in the detailing. It looks very elegant, very puritanical, very abstracted, very spare. And it can remind us, as I said before, that it probably would, of, of, of Glasgow, Charles Rennie Mackintosh in Glasgow, where Mackintosh is so how delicate this becomes and how abstracted, the same way there. And I said that there was certainly a relationship between that, especially the, his facades, with Loos. And here's Loos, who'd written in 1905 that ornament was crime. It builds the Steiner House the same year as this, in 1910, which is so closely related to what Gill was doing. It's also, I think, related to what he's doing. That's a part of it, too. It's to clean it up. It's the puritanical side that will get stronger and stronger in the international style. Now you can ask yourself, is there any evidence of influence from Frank Lloyd Wright? Because Frank Lloyd Wright was being published in Berlin in just this year, in 1910, by Vosmuth. You remember how he'd gone to Europe for that publication. One place reminds us of Wright's stripping. This is a very important place, too. It's a major entrance hall in the building. And all this stuff looks a little like Wright's own house up there. And this kind of stripping looks like Wright, but not much. I mean, you, you, you couldn't say with anything that there was, or even the, the little watchman's posts, where they would check in when they go in, with again the corner window, but then the projection is playing behind it, and the brick piers, skinny though, uh, you say Wright would never do that, but remember there's one place he did do it, and I'll show it to you in a minute. But again, it's not very strong. But when you get to 1914, when Grobius had a chance to look at Wright and think about it, Wright had two publications, remember. Vosmuth in 1910, it's all drawings. Vosmuth in 1911, it's drawings and photographs. Both of those are available to Gropius. This is a model factory 
in the Werkbund exhibition in Cologne of 1914. That's the headquarters building, and it's at the head of a courtyard which comes down toward us. At the other end of the courtyard is the basic machine shop, and that you might say, well, it's a little elegant, but it, you might say it's pure barrens. It's just expressing the truss inside. But this building is very different. This is very designed. You have horizontal continuities. You have a plane across the top. You have two pavilions on the sides. You have a repetition of thin brick piers. Behind glass, all behind glass. Tight glass right up to them. You have a very white doorway. Now, when you look at it, you can't help but think, I think, I'm sorry it's such a bad photograph, but I'll show you a photograph in a minute of Wright's uh, Mason City Hotel that I showed you a long time ago. The Mason City Hotel, you see, has got the same parties, two pavilions on the sides, overhanging roofs, which from below look flat. Remember, Wright's low hip, dot in the middle, and so on. But, and white here. For some reason, when he drew this in Fiesole, I remember he did it in 1909, in Cheney, this was left white, which is not. In the, in the bank, actually. And he makes it white, too, so you see, that's what he saw, I think. And if you look at the building itself, you see how it's the, it's the father, all right, but it's been changed a lot. For example, in Wright, the glass is of no importance. What uh, it counts are the masses which come forward in the glass serve to indicate voids, because it's back in shadow. So you're not getting transparencies, you're not getting that surface quality of glass. See how dark it is? Also, and here he brings it right to the front, it goes across everything with glass. Look at the corner like this. And then here, you get thick piers and thicker piers, and you get a syncopation. You get right working that. But not here, it's all boom, 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 boom. But you do get that in a right building, which is right next to the hotel. And that's the bank, one of Wright's worst buildings, which you saw before, where you have those very thin piers up above, which look so out of scale. Out of Yes, I was getting, see, you get them again. Now here, it's so fascinating what architects will take. Here's Gropius, looks at a building that anyone would say is probably, if we look back over time now, hindsight, you say that's one of the worst buildings ever did, worst scale, so it doesn't really look like him at all. And, and then, but that's what he likes, that's what he takes. He doesn't see the other stuff that is really great, right stuff, that's not what he's after. It's after that repetition, but then, Instead of the glass being behind, you see, the glass is in front. Man, he's mad for the glass. That's the real thing that I think is touching. The thing that Louis Kahn hated so much later. Louis Kahn was trying to get right back to right, you might say. In any event, on the other side, you have a Wrightian suggestion too. The way you have it on a platform and symmetrical and plain overhead like that reminds you of an un finished project by Wright called the Horror Boat Club of 1902. It's one of his few really flat roof buildings because it was a concrete slab. And, uh, and it is symmetrical, like this, and it slides by the building with the glass underneath it making a void by going over the solid corners like that, like this. But what Gropius does, he gets the solid corner and then hmm, he extrudes the glass like a glass blower. It's really wonderful, it's so pure as it comes out. That very thin glass with that helical which must be a cantilevered slab stair going up inside it. And it must have really blown people's minds, as if all of a sudden he subverts the building, subverts the corner, it goes out like that. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of what it's like to walk up those stairs, but there was another glass building at that Cologne ex Werkbund exhibition in 1914. It was by our friend Bruno Taut early in life, and it's this cone, not nearly as elegant as these, but there is a photograph here inside it of the stairs going up, but the stairs here aren't as elegant as these, I don't think, either, because they seem to be able to see through it. It seems to be separate. Well, maybe not. It's hard to tell. Maybe these are just to light you here. Whatever the case, you really feel that that's a continuous slab. And it's a very beautiful helix inside that blown glass thing. So I said, all right, here's Gropius in 1914, just before the war, I mean just before the war. And here are his two buildings, and they both love glass and they both subvert classicism, turn it right around. Almost, you might say, in favor of glass. Then he goes through the whole war, and he's in the cavalry, so he's lucky he doesn't have too much, doesn't serve on the Eastern Front where the cavalry was active. He gets through the war in one piece, 
But at the end of it, he obviously must, be, must have been tired. And he became head of what was a arts and crafts school. Uh, and it was in Weimar, which is in Germany's one of the most sacred places, one of its most traditional places, Goethe's home, Goethe's place. And it was called, later it was going to be called the Bauhaus. At that time it was called the, I think, the German Arts and Crafts School. And it is arts and crafts. And he, he built a house with the students of that school in 1921, the Sommerfeld House in Germany. And you can see it doesn't look, it looks like a log cabin. It goes all the way back. And on the other hand, if you go inside, it's not only all artsy and crafty, but it's a suggestion of Caligari. There's a suggestion of that expressionist mood that was so strong in Germany at that time. And I say that partly because then, in the same year, in 1921, he builds a memorial to the socialists who were shot in the abortive revolution of 1918, shot by the army, the right wing, and so on. And it was destroyed by the Nazis, but it was rebuilt after World War II. And you see, he picks up that diagonal. And it's rather touching. You don't think of Gropius doing something like that. So he has that. And, he, and, and, and at this time, the Bauhaus is an arts and crafts school, but it doesn't want to be. And he's building up around him people like uh, Paul Clay, and especially uh, uh, his, his uh, partner Meyer, and Itten, and Lisitsky comes, though they write him out of its history later and they have to get him back later. And they're clearly sick of the building they're in. And this is the building. It's by a Dutch architect advanced for his time named Van de Velde, about 1900, about, about the time the school was founded in 1906. And they have a lot of glass, but it's not what they want with the roof and all that. Not really what Gropius wants. Also, the student, it's getting more and more, doesn't like the arts and crafts tangle either. It wants to be involved with industry, getting all the hallmarks of the international style, and also it's very strong leftist or, uh, orientation. It's interesting, they don't do a damn thing for workers' housing, really, that makes any sense, but they do more talking about the social revolution than the architects who are really building great workers' housing at the same time, nevertheless. And so the townspeople in Weimar are sick of them. They're reds, they're nasty, the students are making trouble all the time. They want to get out of there. So finally they get shunted off to East Germany, toward the east, uh, where you have a, an industrial town, a tough industrial town, more in accord with what they want. And that's Weimar. I mean, that's Dessau. Now, they built, start building the new Bauhaus in Dessau in 1925. They move in late 1924. They build a building in 25 and 26. And you can see the style has completely changed utterly changed between this one and that one. It's a new world. Now, and it's, it's farther than anything we've seen so far, either, in the development of the international style. Only the glass, only that beloved glass, out in front of everything that we see, we see it again, it's come back now. But this whole hard, sharp organization, this graphic on one edge, that whole composition, that's new. Now, that whole composition comes from painting. There's no question about that. This, I talked about the pictorialism of architecture. It really starts early in the modern age. And now this is one where the modern movement utterly claims the opposite. Hitchcock, would, who was one of the great historians of the international style, would never, later he wrote a book called Architecture Out of Painting, but he didn't mean it. He was late in life. He always attacked the, the, the connection with painting. He didn't like it. He wanted it to be out of architecture. That, in that he was absolutely mirroring the basic thoughts, and, but they really were. It was painting. This is one of the real things the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. That's what used to bother me about Harvard's education, about Gropius' education at Harvard. The left hand didn't admit what the right hand was doing, and I thought that was always dangerous. In any event, how does it come again? It starts with Cubism. We're always talking about the events of around 1910. Gideon is the best one to read, to read the propaganda and how this develops or not the way it develops, but what they believe. And remember, cubism starts to abstract, right? This is analytical cubism. Now, however, a few years later, they're doing synthetic cubism, which takes that yeasty, uh, chaotic look of analytical cubism and clarifies it. So he simplifies it. Fewer forms, clear cut. Then the Dutch, God bless them, take it and abstract it completely. 
And that's Dutch de style. That's the Dutch de style movement that develops around Rotterdam in World War I. The best known people, of course, are, are Theo van Duisburg and Piet Mondrian, right here. Here's Mondrian here. So the paintings of the 1920s, but he's doing this in the teens at right this time. Now, in 1910, a really very good German art historian who never, nobody would pay attention to because he, he did work for the Nazis, but nevertheless, he was a good one named Ernst Warringer wrote a really very good book called Empathy and Abstraction. And he tried to say, he saw how important abstraction had become. Look at this, already in 1910. And he saw how important it was. And he said, once we had empathy, and he associates it with 19th century classicism, with the physical association of the viewer with the object viewed, as I already said. He talked about that. Then he said, though, now it's changed. Now what's come in now is abstraction. And with abstraction, we don't have empathy. We have pattern. We have an appreciation of pattern. Now here's where I diverge from it. Because I say, if you look at a Mondrian, you really feel it empathetically. It's the real test of it. You don't have to have the human figure to be able to identify physically, otherwise you couldn't identify with paintings at all. Not really. So, so what, sometimes the red is up there and it's big, tiny little yellow thing down here. This is pushed over this way. Big white square. Sometimes that's all space. A little space on both sides. And I claim you read Mondrian purely empathetically. Look at this one, just look at it. Now look at this one. Shoo! I mean, really, it comes over. I mean, it's dramatic. This is terrific stuff. It really is. And look at no, let me do it again. It's really terrific. And both of this in there, he exploits that. He's exploiting that. And uh, he. Uh, Monian himself said it most clearly. He, he wrote a little book called uh, Plastic Art and Pure Plastic Art, by which he means purely empathetic art because he wants to take all associations out. Now notice how, do you associate anything with these? I mean, people have talked so much about Dutch fields of tulips and neatness and so on. But I don't know, maybe it is. It's hard to take association out of any form. Our brain seeks for associational references all the time, but basically it is empathy. And that's what they're after. That's why they want to abstract. They want only oceanic associations, not, as Freud would have said, not specific ones. Remember, Wright did the same thing when he tried to make it not look like a room, but like an eternal cavern. Same thing. And that Gropius picks up. Now, this is the passion. I hope you felt that, because you go over the library, though, which I do after the last year. I want to get in those crazy books of this period, really one of the, where you really feel that's what they care about. That's what really has a dignity in this whole crazy process, is the aesthetic passion that's in here for these things. I can remember the time I'd walk down Chapel Street in New Haven and say, why can't all the storefronts be like that? Why, why does it have to be anything else? I mean, you may think I'm insane, it may well be the case, but if so, we all were in that period, basically, if you're really involved with this kind of thing. And of course, I came to it late, but nevertheless. And at the same time, in Holland, in Rotterdam, Café d'Oni, uh, by uh, J.J.P. Oud, O-U-D, same thing. And look at him, how wonderful he goes with this, which might almost be a Van Duisburg, but it really is a Mondrian. Like this. All right, so you can see that. Now, there's another question to ask ourselves. Can Frank Lloyd Wright, whom I point out before as being important, can he have any part in this? Well, if you take the second Vosmuth volume, where well, you get photographs. You get photographs where right houses all of a sudden do not suggest any urbanistic setting. We know how important this is. This is the Ward Willits house. We know how important it's fitting into the lot is in the Ward Willits house. But you get a view like this, you don't have any sense of the lot. You don't have any sense of the urbanity around it. It's spinning, it's free in space. And look, see, if you take this, it's not hard if you take the roof off and flatten it all to go to that. Very close. Very, very close. Now, now then, then you go from that to the other the style art, one or the other, which is sculpture. And you get a sculptor named Van Tongerloo, and in 1919 he does this. Now you see, this is now like this, without the stripes. Take those off. Become plastic. And they're all coming from one plane. Now you can take that, and you can make a house out of it. As Rietveld, again, old Garrett Rietveld does in the Schroeder House in Utrecht in 1924. 
where you see, look how, look, he doesn't give a damn about the site, about context. Look where he's at the end of a housing group. Look at it. Look at the scale. He takes this little lot at the end. He has a nice chance. He doesn't give a damn about them. He's a little, you know, little painting. You see, this, it's really this, now turned vertical instead of horizontal. But in this photograph, it even does look, it doesn't, it really doesn't look, the horizontal plane doesn't look as important as it is. And it isn't, it disappears here. You have an abstract composition, basically coming forward. Now then there's that other side. There's that side that they're, now that you're free like a painter, why should you have any urbanistic restrictions? That's what they couldn't stand. Why do you have to? Hitchcock, who was my beloved master, nevertheless, he would, he would talk about the buildings around the Etoile in Paris. And he would say, they're very nice buildings. They fit in very well with there, but they're only building, not architecture because they're urbanistically contextual. Madness. It had a stand like a bunch of paint. Buildings became like a bunch, and they still are for the, public, for the magazine, like a bunch of paintings. You go from one place to another and see. Each one has to be different than the other. Each one can be, because the art is completely free. What does the context mean? What does the city mean? No, it's not to this vision. You take it, you can't stand up to this vision. And of course, this is a totalitarian vision. I mean, it's not founded, it's not, pointing toward blood or conquest or anything, but it's totalitarian, it's all one. It's, it's jealous. Now here's, here's Van Duisburg with Van Esther, 1922. Now he's got that spin. Now he's got it where it's free of everything. It's free of statics. It's free of weight and mass. It's free of diminution in space. It's free of all uh, uh, bin binocular vision. It's all monocular, they get rid of uh, perspective, which is what Wright used to use all the time. He said they have isometric. Why do they have isometric? Because in an isometric, 30 and 60, it looks closest like a cubist painting. Like this. Also, it's simpler. That's very important for the schools. You know how simple it is to draw an isometric. It's the only kind of drawing I can do. Isometric is so simple. It's true dimensions, 30, 60, no problem. Perspectives are hard. I got that right? space. So you get an isometric and you don't, you have all around you is the house. And sometimes it's upside down, sometimes it's sideways. But which is right side up, which is upside down, where is it? It's all spinning, it doesn't matter where it is. There's no structure, there's no mass, no statics. It's all free float. You're as free as a painter. And you are a painter. He is a painter. Get right there. And see, they, they can get that from here. They could see it there. Because again, that great principle of misreading, you always misread your influence to tell you what you want to see, always, in any event. And so you get the Bauhaus spin. And it, the good thing is that this is the photograph they loved of their Bauhaus. So you see it free from all urbanistic restrictions. But we know that there are buildings all around here. And we know that they're actually developed quite a decent relationship between this and the building across the street. But they airbrushed all that out. That stuff was there. They doctored that photograph, they took it all out because they wanted free, floating in space. Now the other thing, so we see where all that comes from, let's say. And, and then, how about all this glass? Well, we saw that Gropius always liked that, and before. And here you have it, but here you have it in a very special way, where you have the normal pattern structure behind it, and the glass just a little forward. So in fact, the plane is weightless, that is, it's not supporting. That's the major principle, but you see the support behind it. Okay. Now, I know it comes out of his own work, but it's also another source right then that he looked at. And that's, again, that J.J.P. Oud in Holland. In 1922, J.J.P. Oud did a housing group where a large part of it, you see, he showed you the columns and the glass are just in front of it, you see, to make the whole thing look light. This is made of masonry mass, but the way you detail it and you let you see that, you get the feeling that's weightless too. That's the whole idea of it. And you see how much this is a, a small thing if you compare it with the Amsterdam School, where you feel this city, building, massive, weight, so on, all that, big scale. This is really suburban. Well, all the talking it does about the international style is not really a city architecture in that sense yet. Not with these people who do it. And, but now, and the reason I show this one is that in the very first scheme that Gropius and his partner Hannes Meyer uh, proposed to the Bauhaus, you can see how they're affected by this. 
It's got the curving thing like food. It's got a curving here with the columns, which we'll presume are behind the glass, which goes around there. Then, however, that lost out to the overwhelming influence of that wonderful vision of Monuments, as we saw it already. And of course, there's the glass, though, used in that way. Now, that glass is so important because the vulnerability of those surfaces, whether glass or stucco painted, it is picture architecture. Look what happens to it when it's not kept up properly. It's horrible. It's all on the surface. The, the life is all on the surface. I'm not attacking it for this. One should attack the 20th century for this because it's because of the war and Nazis and then the war and everything else. But nonetheless, you see what happens. You see, too, that how important that glass is, especially if you come around, move around to the right in that group with the housing onto the right back there. Looking back, the Bauhaus is, I don't know why, we don't, there it is over there. See how wonderful that plane of glass is. Look what happens to it, how tragic that was. Now it's all been restored. And what you can appreciate now is the really marvelously confusing, I mean, it's kind of wonderful, it really takes a building apart, uh, circular plan, weaving a plan, going around like this. See, we got these big machine shops and we got this other, but we really hardly know what they are. The housing is different standing over like this. We're looking in this view in this direction. There's the Bauhaus is way over there. The thing swings around like that with that Bauhaus thing there. Faces the main street like this. So this is just looking down the street. Takes this other one that's across from it. And you get the, you get the, wonderful, you get the wonderful whirling plan. Wonderful hurling uh, volume of the building. Like that. And you get, too, really that facade, that little, it did face a housing project. Maybe some of you have been there. Some people from the school have been there. A few years ago, there was a very good charrette they had there. There is a housing project right across the street, which really fits beautifully in relation to that, across that street. But that's, again, that's not what they wanted to see. I want to see anything. It's all, it's, all, it's all free. Now, there's somebody else that's involved. And we go back to that same painter. Go back to Malievich. I'm going to talk about him more in a minute in detail. But you see, he takes his planes and he overturns our sense of empathy and makes us feel the opposite of body weight. He makes us feel flight. He makes us feel freedom. I'll show you that better maybe. He frees the planes. Now, I'm sure they're thinking in these terms of those rooftops. Because how he is, all they love these views, they must have thought about those rooftops a lot. They are flat black planes doing that. And they pick up this kind of thing that's up in the sky business in their little balconies that they have in their dormitory building. Like that. Now that's very small scale stuff. But Malievich said, we will throw, and he's thinking of the revolution here, we will throw boulevards into the sky. And then his most famous follower, E. L. Lissitsky, comes along, and he does that. This project in 1919. How do you hold it up? Nobody knows. But there's the old world, there's the new world. It's free, it's floating in the sky, you see. And Gropius picks that up with Hannes Meyer in 1922. Remember the Tribune building where he takes that and he, he makes it a decoration. But it's the same thing. He brings his building alive with that. There's the old Chicago window alive with the Dutch to style, or rather with the, uh, Russian suprematism. And then these people make it, immediately, they make it German, middle class. Small scale. It's kind of touching though, these artists feeling they're going to change the world with this aesthetic. They're going to change it. And they love to show off and have these little parties and so on. It's kind of touching that you get it there. Now, what does that come out of? Malievich, to me, is one of the most moving stories in the world. There's his apartment. The house of the pre, well, the house of the pre-revolution and the revolutionary Russian intellectuals, one of the most touching in the world. Tiny little places. Tiny little places packed with canvases, packed with books, packed with culture, packed with life. And I understand after Glasnost, all of that gone. Because no longer persecuted, people read comic books. So I'm told. Anyway, that may not be so. But the, the place of the intellectual, the wonderful place of the Russian intellectual, so moving. That Russian kid who said everybody needs everything. That's what these intellectuals felt and feel. Here's Malievich. He's painting war propaganda like this stuff. He did this thing on the left. And he hates it. So he'd go home to his apartment at night and he'd do these things. And you see they're all in flight. 
Later they became revolution. Here's the black square and the red square. And he does a series of them. And watch what they do. You really can feel them flaw. You really feel them approach each other like that. To overturn the he frees us. He frees us. All those centuries of empathy. And then wait. He frees us. And that's what the revolution felt. And their early propaganda was all about flight. Like that. Or in one of their early projects for a building, the Lenin Library, about a globe that has to be held down and a high, thin thing that has to be guy wired and held up. It's the opposite of the empathy of weight. Oh, it's this. So his most important painting is one which he says, airplane flight. And out of this, you see, Lissitsky, his student, makes these what he calls prongs, where he makes rooms where what's up, what's down? Where are you? It's all in flight. It's all whirling. It's changed the world. And then poor old Melnikov, Konstantin Melnikov tries to make these, these things where they, uh, in these uh, workers, uh, this is a tram workers clubhouse, the whole the, uh, auditorium going up like this. And then he's picked up by Jim Sterling, and, oh, and, and poor Malievich here for a big monument, tries to show it all to him. This. Jim Sterling picks up in the 60s at Leicester. And then Gary picks it up in his early work. I'll show you later how close he is in some of these things to Magievich. And so all the construction, the de deconstructivism is really Russian constructivism, Russian suprematism, as Philip Johnson well knew. The Wexner Center, so he tears it apart. It's in flight, like this. It's deconstructed. Where are you? It's all in pieces. And all stabilities are overset. It's going to hit the glass. Not supported. Where are you? But there's another side, too. There's the use of the word. And the deconstructivists don't deal with that. I'll talk about that next time. Thanks. <laughs>